Well, greetings, everyone. Just wanted to break in here for just a few minutes to um, spend some time on a uh, case that has a lot of interesting updates that I have not really had a chance to get to. So I figured we'll do a little uh, little peeking at this stuff here now. Philip Haney, if you've never heard of Philip Haney, that's exactly what we're going to talk about here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the uh, share my screen and we're going to go over uh, just some of the basic things about Philip Haney, the justice for Philip Haney group that Dan Hannon created, started, and um, we're going to go through some of the stuff on the website. Bear with me if I'm squinting my eyes. I do not have my glasses on. <laughs> All right, so if you've never heard of this case, here it is. Justice for Philip Haney, DHS whistleblower. In the About Me section, talks about what the purpose of this group is here. So <clears throat> Phil Haney was found shot to death in Plymouth, California on February, on Friday, February 21st, 2020. This was not a suicide. And Mr. Haney stated he would never commit suicide. Very important when a person states that will never commit suicide. Any of you out there doing any extensive research on knowledgeable topics, um, doesn't hurt, it takes about 30 seconds to make that video and just say, hey, I will never commit suicide as well. We should all have one. Um, as a Christian, I know how wrong it would be to commit suicide. And so there would be no excuse for that. And as a Christian, I know that if somebody did want to hurt me and discredit me and hurt my family, they would uh, kill me and they would make it look like a suicide. Is that what happened here with Philip Haney? That's what we're going to be discussing here today. So again, this is a Facebook group. This is a public group created by Dan Hinnon. There is uh, Philip Haney and we're going to, I'm going to jump right into the discussion. Actually, I'm going to see what's in the media. Um, so there's a lot of photos and things like that in there, but it looks like we need to get some more files. Um, but you can go through the photos that are in there as well. Uh, I don't think there's any videos, so but um, would be nice to get some files in there as well at some point. So, all right, let's go back into this discussion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort it by newest post. Oh, I want to sort it by newest post. Um, yeah, sort of by, yeah, yeah, by newest post. Um, because there's some great articles in here that I want to make sure to cover. And then um, we'll kind of address uh, some of the questions and concerns that people obviously have. Um, nothing wrong with that. And so here's a um, very good uh, post here too. And I have not seen the autopsy. I've only seen um, some of the photos that were posted about the suicide note, which to me seems very suspect. But um, this is from Pamela. And what she says, she just says, I'm going over Phil's autopsy. Can anyone who knew him personally tell me if he had a cleft lip or palate or both? Page two of the sheriff's report of the autopsy states, quote, mouth contains normal dentition, dentition of upper and lower jaw. And a little further down states, no identifying scars or tattoos. A cleft lip repair would be an identifying scar and dentation of the upper jaw um, just might be a variable, just asking. So excellent um, comment there. And uh, Pamela, if you're watching this, definitely thank you for um, being a big contributor in the uh, group. And um, uh, if you can point us people in the right direction for the autopsy, that would be very helpful. And again, I'm sure they're here somewhere in, in the group, but maybe what we'll do is we'll try to make a place to make it easy for people who want to look at the documents, look at the files, look at the stuff that we have, and just put it in one easy to find place. I think that's always very, very helpful. But that's a great question there. Okay, so um, what is this here? Not sure what that one is. The pre election book was important. This is my opinion, a full cover up. So there is a great article that Sonny. Uh, posted. Let's look at this. Philip Haney not resting in peace. This is from frontpagemag.org. Let's open this up, see what we have here. 
Filipani not resting in peace. One year after DHS whistleblower was gunned down, FBI still not re, still not releasing results of forensic investigation. And that was as of February 24, 2021. So let's go ahead and um, read some of this article. I think it may be very, I know it'll be helpful for, for me. Um, It's going to make this bigger so I can actually read it. Uh, I think if I do immerse reader, there we go. Okay, let's read some of this. Um, Filipini is the author of See Something, Say Something. A Homeland Security Officer Exposes the Government Submission to Jihad. I need to read that book because obviously the See Something, Say Something is a direct tie to uh the dhs and all of that and what they were doing see something say something where just wanted us to basically snitch on each other and label each other terrorists and things like that crazy times here's what the article states one year ago on february 21st 2020 philip haney was found quote deceased in our jurisdiction in amador county california according to the county sheriff a forensic autopsy was scheduled and performed but the case was more complicated at that time, we reached out to the Federal Bureau of Investigation to assist in analyzing documents, phone records, numerous thumb drives, and a laptop that were recovered from the scene in Mr. Haney's RV. Those items and numerous other pieces of evidence were turned over to the FBI. The FBI has performed a forensic examination of these items. We expect to receive these reports within the next few weeks. That was, the Amador, that was the Amador County Sheriff in a press release dated July 22nd, 2020, their most recent update on the case. Last week, the Amador Sheriff's Office told Front Page there was no new press release and would say nothing else about the case. Last week, Amador Under Sheriff Gary Redmond told Jack Mitchell of the local Ledger Dispatch, we are waiting for a few remaining pieces to be analyzed out of Virginia, but there was no estimated time of arrival. Sources close to Haney told Mitchell the documents found at the scene were from the manuscript of Haney's new book, also on a thumb drive Haney carried at all times. Last September, the Department of Justice told journalist Rex Hastings these items were, quote, exempt from disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, even so, last week, Front Page asked the FBI about the documents, phone records, thumb drives, and laptops. Uh, what did the forensic examination reveal? The Amador, the Amador County Sheriff's Office is the agency conducting the death investigation mentioned below and should be contacted directly. The FBI Public Affairs Office replied in an email, which did provide one detail of significance. This was a, quote, death investigation, similar to the sheriff's report that Mr. Haney was, quote, found deceased, as though he had died of natural causes or in an accident. As the ledger dispatch reported, Haney told friends that if he wound up dead, quote, it won't be from a suicide. Somebody shot Haney dead, the article continues. And as the Amador sheriff noted on February 24, 2020, unfortunately, there was misinformation immediately being put out that we have determined Mr. Haney's death to be a suicide. This is not the case. The sheriff was in possession of Haney's vehicle and the firearm located at the scene. No information on the type of firearm and no customary designation of a crime scene. This type of evasion showed up in early reports of the case. Haney's controversial accusations that the Obama administration could have prevented terrorist attacks were polarizing among Americans. Laura Hoyle of Capital and Celeb News, CNN report, CCN, sorry, not CNN, CCN, Capital and Celeb News reported, uh, Laura Hoy, on February 23rd, 2020, as Hoy explained, Haney's death is likely to become political ammo for Republicans heading into the 2020 presidential elections. According to sources close to Haney, the DHS whistleblower was planning a new book that would help boost support for Donald Trump in the upcoming election. Interesting. That would have earned Haney new enemies. No kidding, which he already had in abundance. Hmm. This is a great article, by the way. Thank you. Um, uh, Sonny for posting this article 
in the uh, Justice for Philippine group. This is really very well written, and um, uh, you can tell, you know, the writer is a quote unquote journalist. That's what we need more of. This is great. This is makes it easy for people like me to kind of get caught up on all this stuff and to go back. And uh, anyways, let's continue on. On August 20th, 2018, Haney authored an article headline, quote, Obama officials should have had their clearances revoked a long time ago. With his vast knowledge of jihadist networks, Haney had provided evidence, not simply accusations, that the Obama administration could have prevented terrorist attacks but didn't. Long before Haney's book, that was a matter of record. As Lessons from Fort Hood explains, the FBI knew that Major Nadal Hassan, a self-described soldier of Allah, was communicating with jihadist Anwar al-Awlaki about killing Americans. Very interesting. The FBI's Washington office dropped the case, and on November 5, 2009, Hassan murdered 13 American soldiers and wounded more than 30 others. The president called it workplace violence, not terrorism or even gun violence. Vice President Joe Biden cited the brave soldiers who fell in what he called a senseless tragedy, not a terrorist attack or even a crime. Very interesting. Wow, this guy, this uh, author is really right on point. This is amazing stuff here. Um, Biden named not a single victim and made no reference to the shooter and his possible motive. With Joe Biden in the White House, look for the Delaware Democrat to decouple terrorism from Islam in the matter of his former boss. The composite character David Garrow described in Rising Star, the making of Barack Obama. True to form, one of Biden's first actions was to cancel Trump's ban on travel from nations where terrorists are active. Yeah, that's pretty disgusting that Biden would do that. But like you said, true to form. Joe Biden was also one of the Democrats who unmasked General Michael Flynn, exposing him to FBI entrapment. As recently revealed, FBI lawyer Kevin Kleinsmith altered a document about CIA asset Carter Page and got off with a tap on the wrist from Judge James Bosberg, who is also presiding judge of the FISA court. FBI Director James Comey and FBI counterintelligence boss Peter Strozuk Strozuk? Uh, participated in a coup attempt against President Trump and got away with no criminal charges. Yeah, there it is. I mean, look at look at all these guys, all the same cast of characters, right? The FBI is now the American KGB, this author writes. A squad of deep state partisans operating above the law. On Joe Biden's watch, the FBI is unlikely to reveal what was on Philip Haney's computer, thumb drive, and documents found at the scene. They saw something, but say nothing. Philip Haney is not resting in peace. The struggle of the people against jihad is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Fascinating article. Fascinating. This was written by Lloyd Billingsby, um, dated February 24, 2021. Fascinating article. Um, Wow, interesting. Lots of great links. What I love, too, is this article has a lot of links that you can actually uh, go to and uh, get these documents. That's so important in this world now to be able to quickly get the documents, get the references, get the sources out to people um, because we know how these fake fact checkers work. Let's continue on then. I'm going to play this uh, video here, seven minutes. This is from Counter Jihad video. Ex-DHS whistleblower Philip Haney testifies on America's willful blindness to jihad. This is from the Ted Cruz hearing, Islamic terror, Philip Haney's testimony. Let's go ahead and uh, about seven minutes here. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify here today. Also, I'd like to express my appreciation for the patience of the members on the committee and Senator Coons while obtaining a copy of my written testimony. I'd like to start with a visual aid. This is the Homeland Security Advisory Council 
Countering Violent Extremism Subcommittee Interim Report for 2016. My colleague referred to it earlier as a, a, a suggesting that we should refrain from using words like umma or jihad or sharia. I would like to also show you another visual aid, and this is what is called the Words Matter Memo that was published in January of 2008. And my story today is going to be what happened between these two documents, these two touchstone documents, 2008 and 2016, because it was during that period of time that what we know now as the countering violent extremism policy came to be. And one of the expressions of that policy is what we heard all about in the media in, in a few days after the Orlando shootings, that R Attorney General Lynch was going to release partial transcript of Orlando 911 calls with all references to Islamic terrorism removed. That is a con condensation of what was actually happening behind the scenes with subject matter experts like myself who were sworn officers to protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic. Between these two dates, 2008 and 2016, came what I call the first great purge. When I was ordered by the Department of Homeland Security headquarters to modify a euphemism, removing all linking information out of approximately 820 text subject records in our law enforcement system that almost exclusively had to do with Muslim Brotherhood Network here in the United States. I was told to remove all unauthorized references to terrorism, that I was no longer allowed to do what are called memorandums of information received, what we call MOIRs, no more text records, no more research, and no more special treatment from the agency. But during that time, hundreds of law enforcement actions had been taken in the three-year period when those 820-plus records were still in the law enforcement system, system. At exactly the same time, a controversial inaugural meeting took place on January 20. 27th and 28th, 2010, between American Muslim leaders and the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano, which was hosted by the Department of Homeland Security Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. It was controversial because several of the individuals attended the invitation only conference in DC were known affiliates of at least two of the same Muslim Brotherhood front groups that had just been named as unindicted co-conspirators in the largest terrorism trial in the history of the United States, the Holy Land Foundation trial. Also that spring, at least six individuals with known affiliations to the Muslim Brotherhood front groups were appointed to the Countering Violent Extremism CVE Working Group, which was convened under the authority of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. I would like to just show you now the logo of the Muslim Brotherhood, the moderate organization that this administration chose to ally itself with. Across the middle it says al Aqwan al Muslimin, which means the brothers of the Muslim or the Muslim Brotherhood. And at the bottom, taken from Quran 860, is the word Wayayuda, which means prepare yourselves to terrify your adversaries with steeds of war or weapons of war. That is the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood. By the spring of 2010, we had come to the point that a CBP officer was literally moving, linking information, meaning the dots, on Muslim Brotherhood linked individuals from texts while the administration was bringing the very same individuals into positions of influence to help create and implement our counterterrorism policy both in the domestic arena and in the foreign policy arena as evidenced in our overt support of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Libya, Algeria, and Syria. Fast forward to August 30, 2011 when the Tablighi Jamaat Court a uh, case that I worked on was approved by the Chief Counsel of Department of Homeland Security. And this is an icon of the Top League Jamaat movement, one of the largest in the world. Outside of the United States, it's called the Army of Darkness. I began a TDY assignment needing temporary duty at the National Targeting Center in November of 2011. Within six months, we had instituted 1,200 law enforcement actions on the case that we had started. But in September of 2012, what I call the second great purge, when the administration removed 67 linking records out of that case that had direct ties both to the San Bernardino Mosque, 
Darulum al Islamiyah San Bernardino, and the Islamic Center of Fort Pierce down in Florida. In other words, the network that we have worked on at NTC is tied directly to the terrorist attacks that we've seen recently. At the end of my career, I was relieved of my service weapon. All access to text was cut off and suspended. My secret clearance was revoked, and I was sequestered for 11 months while the, re while the results of three simultaneous investigations from three different branches of the government were concluded. In July of 31 of last year, I retired honorably. In conclusion, the threat of Islamic terrorism does not just come from a network of armed organizations such as Hamas and ISIS who are operating over there somewhere in the Middle East. In fact, branches of the same global network have been established here in America, and they are operating in plain sight, especially among those of us who have been charged with the duty of protecting our country from threats both foreign and domestic. The goal, meaning the strategy of the global Islamic movement, is based on Quran 2, 191 through 193, and is actually quite simple, to establish Sharia law everywhere in the world, including here in America. And there is an organization in the United States that's actively doing that. It's called the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. Very benign sounding name, but in Arabic it is Majama Fukaha al Sharia bi Amrikiya the group of lawyers implementing Sharia law in the United States, which is unconstitutional. The threat that we face today that continues growing despite the willful blindness of those who insist on pretending otherwise are not the tactical methods of violent extremism, terrorism, or even operative verbs such as jihad, but rather the historical and universally recognized Islamic strategic goal of impl implementing Sharia law everywhere in the world so that no other form of government, including the United States Constitution, is able to oppose its influence over the lives of those who must either submit to its authority, become second-class demi-citizens, or perish. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. All right, and now we're going to continue on taking a little um, look at uh, Philip Haney and I'm gonna share my screen again because there is this article that I really want to go over. Um, this is a photo that was posted in the group, Justice for Philip Haney group. So I'm gonna do my best to try to enlarge this and then read it here as we go. Uh, this was by, this is called, this is written for the Ledger Dispatch, and title is The Last Days of Philip Haney, written by Chris Chrisman. So again, I'm trying to enlarge this a little more so I can read it to you. Okay, let's read through this together. Two years after his death, the Amador County Sheriff's Office, ACSO, and the FBI released two massive reports to document that Phil Haney died of a self-inflicted gunshot, i.e. suicide. The report, stated March 8, 2022, include 468 pages of documents and 723 photos. Download before April 4th, 2022 at Swiss Transfer Doc. Oh, I missed it. Okay, well, if anyone has that, um, I'd love to get a copy of that, but um, I'm sure somebody has it backed up somewhere. Um, definitely need to get that because uh, today is the sixth. <laughs> so I missed that by two days. Darn. But that's a lot of documents there 468 pages of documents and 723 photos. We need to get that somehow um, and make sure everyone in the group can have access to it. Most of the contents have to do with chain of custody records generated as evidence is passed between local sheriff's department and the FBI. It appears throughout these records that the ACSO was concerned about the FBI taking over a local routine death investigation, while the FBI was concerned about uncovering, re retrieving and retaining flash drives, iPhones, and other documents possessed by Phil Haney. The disparity between the resources of the FBI versus those of ACSO is illustrated by the 13 person FBI team mastered, mustered to search the two vehicles belonging to Phil Haney versus ACSO's entire 10 person investigation team. FBI report, page 27. It is also significant that the FBI report contains only one field interview, that of Benjamin Ungerman, on May 5th, 2020. 
This interview was conducted in Omaha, Nebraska, where Phil Haney had a, me had a meeting earlier on February 3rd, 2022, with Republican Senator Don Bacon. This meeting was to get Senator Bacon's help to revive the investigation into corruption in the Department of Homeland Security, FBI report, page 262. The FBI wanted to know who might have the files on Haney's whistleblowing data. Interesting. All of this is to say that the only insight into why Phil Haney committed suicide came from the ACSO. The best way to understand the situation is to reconstruct the timeline. This is an excellent point right here. Um, this, and thank you, I think it was John Donor for posting this. Um, I really hope somebody grabbed all of that. Um, link and i'm looking at some of the comments here man it looks like we didn't get the link to the actual um uh, we're gonna have to find that okay we have to find that link to get those documents there all right it looks like the file is still up there so i am actually downloading it right now i just needed to um do that as much as that's a big file wow it's going to take three hours, but it's still up. It's still active. Uh, so I'm going to actually post that link for anyone else that wants it as well. Uh, okay, let me go back. Sorry, I got sidetracked to where I was, um, but I really just needed to get that. Okay, so let's go back to this. Here is the timeline. Let's go through the timeline here. February 4, 2020, approximately, Phil Haney complains of anxiety, insomnia, and a racing heart. He checks himself into the Sutter Amador Hospital emergency room with heart-related issues. It was from this point that his sister says his personality changed. February 16th, Bill Haney calls his sister, Diana Lee Kappel, and says he needed her. She met him at the 49er RV park in Plymouth and took him back to her home in Granite Bay, 35 miles away, where he stayed for four days. After his anxiety subsided, she brought him back to his RV in Plymouth about uh, 12.30 p.m. on February 19th, ACSO Coroner's Report, page 155. The following happened on February 20th, 12.40 p.m. Phil Haney has an appointment with cardiolo cardiologist, Dr. Sonia Ragkevin. She runs an EKG and other tests and determines that he has a leaky mitral valve, estimated leak 60 to 65%. The doctor determined that this was a serious problem that needed open heart surgery sooner than later. She emphasized he would not die from his present condition, but needed to correct it before it became life-threatening. ACSO Coroner's Report, page 82. The preoperative appointment would be February 24, 2 p.m. Phil reports the medical situation to his fiance, Denise Lynn Gary Pandel, who lives in Bakersfield, some 275 miles away. They would have to postpone their April 4 wedding date, but Denise assured Phil that rescheduling was not that big a deal. The conversation discussed other plans and adjustments needed. The conversation lasted about one hour. ACSO Coroner's Report, page 156. At 4.57 p.m., this is all still on um, February 19th. So, uh, I'm sorry, February 20th at 4.57 p.m., Phil calls Denise, no answer. 5.04 p.m. Phil calls Denise, no answer. 5.11 p.m., Phil calls his sister, Diana, to discuss the diagnosis. The call lasts 10 minutes. 5.36 p.m., Phil calls his brother, Terry, to share the medical diagnosis. Terry assures him the surgery is now common and is no big deal. This call lasts eight minutes. FBI report, page 143. 5.56 p.m. to 6.04 p.m., Phil sends the same text message to three friends. Hello, friend. I learned today that I'll need to have urgent open heart surgery repair uh, to repair a badly damaged mitral valve. It'll probably happen in the next week or so with a three-month recovery. FBI report, page 145. Those were the last communications by Phil. His suicide note is dated February 21st, 2020.
Wow. This is written by Chris Chrisman, and he is a Los Angeles resident and a friend of Filipini. The views and opinion expressed in this article are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of anyone other than the author listed. Great article. Again, thanks, John, for finding that. Um, yeah. Keep you guys posted on that. Uh, I want to get this transferred first. Once I have it downloaded and secured, then I will um, copy this link and I will share it into the group. I just want to make sure I have it all backed up here, just in case, because this was supposed to be deleted on um, the 4th, and this says these files will be deleted for 15 2022 So grab them while you can. I just want to make sure there's no shenanigans going on here. So I will make sure to get that and make sure that everyone will have access to it. All right, so while we're waiting for that to finish download, um, I think one thing we want to get to, let's see, we read the front page, news one. I think we want to go through the um, alleged suicide note, right? Because that was posted here. Um, Dan Hannon did post that. So let's go ahead. I'll find that here. And we will go through that. Right now, premiering live on my one of my YouTube channels, Greg Fernandez Jr. I do have, um, it's about five hours, almost six hours long. And it is um, a compilation of some of Philip Haney's speeches, which I have not read, or I'm sorry, have not watched or listened to. I, I will make an audio version, a podcast type version for people that want to listen to it that way too. But there's some really good stuff here. Um, so if you do have a chance to check that out, on YouTube, just put in Greg Fernandez Jr. or Philip Haney speeches. All these speeches can be found on YouTube. I just wanted to have a compilation of a bunch of them in one video. So it is about five or six hours long there. Good to have, I think. Uh, how much longer does this have to go here? 43 minutes. Okay, it's jumping around. So that's going to be a while here. But um, that's good news. That's good news. I'm glad that we were able to find that. That um, is a big, big deal. And watching some of what Phil Haney was talking about in those videos has been uh, very, um, very interesting. So uh, Pamela has a great post here. Maybe we should read this because this probably relates to the suicide note. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll actually, um, I think we should get, do the suicide note first. Now let's read this first, then we'll get to the suicide note. All right, so I have enlarged this. Let me see if I can even enlarge it a little more or not. Look at that. Okay, yeah, let's read through this. Um, so Pamela on March 24th, this is what she writes. And it sounds like she's looked at all the documents. She has some great posts here that we need to also maybe cover at some point. She says, did anyone see CHP officer Platz's report? He arrived a few moments before Amador officer Casey Betancourt. Lieutenant Cordoza, Detective Peterson, and Detective Ryan were also on scene. No reports from them either. And Detective Ryan located the single 40 cal bullet casing under the dissident's hip, partially buried in the gravel. Mr. Craddock, who worked for Caltrans, noticed the red Nissan at 6.40 a.m. on February 21, 2020. At 9.52 a.m., it was still parked there and noticed Dissident's feet on the ground. Called out but didn't notice that he was shot. He called his supervisor to meet him there and left to make a quick run for another load of brush. At 10.05, he and co-workers went to the Dissident and noticed he was covered in blood and the gun resting on the chair. Another co-worker, Montana, Montano, dropped off a load of brush at 9.25 a.m. and remembers seeing the red Nissan. He also remembers seeing a white work truck parked in the turnout about the same time. He believed it he believed was a Pacific Gas and Electric truck, PG&E truck. Uh, he remembers seeing a male wearing an orange vest and was using his cell phone. Don't see any report of trying to locate this person. 
Phil was pronounced dead at 10.25 a.m. The funeral home was making the removal at 11.10 a.m., so the investigation was less than one hour and the body was moved. Car was moved at 11.25 a.m. Seems kind of quick for me. Um, that's what Pamela says. No time for yellow crime scene tape. They had their quote-unquote suicide note and gun and called it a quick slam dunk suicide and left the scene until they received all the phone calls and found out who he was and did. They didn't find the bullet. They removed him to the funeral home instead of direct autopsy and cut off his clothes and didn't send them to the autopsy about five days later. They put the blood-stained chair in the back of, in the back seat of the car. The unknown male DNAs are not identified, and neither is the Pacific Gas guy. And the list goes on. "Quote: It was suicide because he gave his neighbor his plotted his potted plant, and he seemed depressed." End quote. No mention of a very scary open heart surgery, and he might be getting his things in order in case he doesn't make it through surgery. There was also a sheriff change during this two-year period. That's an interesting, um, great post there, by the way. Um, so, for all of us who have not read, um, have not read this yet, this is great. This is great to to look at it. And um, before we get to where we can actually read it, so there's some great videos too posted by Chuck Bean, some links to some great videos about Phil Haney. So that's good stuff there. Interesting stuff. Um, Pamela has another one here, page 178, the documents. Oh, they finally have downloaded. Okay, cool. So now I'm just gonna make sure I copy this. I want everyone to have this here. Um, DNA test, DNA evidence item one, the pistol. Blood was not detected on the side of male DNA of three individuals on the gun. Who are the other two? That is an awesome point. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Previous owner and who? Cop rolled out. His hands were covered in blood and not on the gun from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And gun found on the seat of the folding metal chair. How does that happen, she asks. Looks like he stood up, possibly clenching his chest, causing the blood on his hands because he missed his heart totally. What are the chances of him shooting himself and grabbing for his chest because of pain and bleeding and the gun lands perfectly on the seat of the chair as if someone placed it there with no blood on it? Wow. He stood up or was standing up and fell on his left knee, then right and landed on the right side with his right arm extended and right hand on the metal frame of the folding chair. No bullet located, only shell casing found under his body. What? Does anyone have a photo of the upright metal folding chair in relation to the body, car and glasses found? Blood found on metal folding chair. Phil's DNA on metal bars and canvas bottom, but two male DNAs, one Phil's on metal bars and seen armrest who's. Wow. Hmm. So interesting. So interesting. Um, boy, she has some great posts. Pamela really does. Uh, we need to. It's a group expert. Um, need some marker as a group expert. Okay, because my battery's probably gonna die here soon. <laughs> um, but uh, I gotta, I gotta read some, some more of her posts over here. Uh, I hope she doesn't mind either. Um, she says, "I see the the sheriff is the coroner. Any unattended death needs to have an autopsy, usually within 24 hours. He probably thought it was a slam dunk suicide and save his budget until so many said it can't be. What I noticed is that the autopsy was on 2:26:20, and the body was delivered in an unsealed body bag without clothes to be examined and without hands bagged to check for the gun residue. I read through the 188 page report and saw that he was fully dressed at the time of the incident and he was released to the local funeral home that cut off his clothes while the presiding deputy watched clothes were bagged but i never saw a report of findings on the clothes entry and exit wound blood spatter 
gunpowder residue, etc. Why didn't they bring the clothes with the body? Also, I see that a gunpowder residue kit was used, but can't find the report of finding. Committing suicide with a chest wound is very rare and usually has a right to left upward tra trajectory, not downward as in this case. Another reason the clothes are so important is a longstanding empirical rule which coroners is that people with coroners is that people who committed suicide rarely shoot through clothing and if they do it is suspicious. I also wanted to see photos of upright camping chair. Was there a bullet hole in the back? I believe he stood up from a sitting sitting position and fell forward on left knee then right and landed on his right side. How does a gun land on the seat of the camping chair? How does the camping chair remain upright if shot, sitting down and no blowback? Unless he was standing up in the process, time of death is still not determined. Only the time the deputy pronounced him dead. If I'm missing something, please let me know. Help me fill in the blanks. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So here is the note. This is from March 10th. Here's Phil's suicide note. Let's see if I can read this here. Uh, I know no one knows me will understand why I took my own life, but there are good reasons. I've been known as an overcomer and a fighter, and I was. I've been known as a lover of beauty, life, and nature. I was. As a lover of Israel and the covenants. I was. As a lover of music and song. I was. There are sometimes hard choices in life when there are no other options but one. Terry, Diana, Tamara, and Michelle, I loved you all. Sarah and Lydia, I loved you too. Thank you, Denise, for loving me. Lori and Lisa, you are part of my life too with love. The password on my computer is, and that's redacted, it will open to an Excel file with all my financial, uh, open to Excel file with all my financial, uh, well, okay, information. Other files are in the redacted. All of my insurance information is on the kitchen counter. My sister Diana is a backup to closing the sale of my house. He was planning on selling the house in Georgia. Those papers are next to the stove. All my other important papers, et cetera, are in the bedroom, in the first drawer, under the TV. The book awards, the other historical items are left in the area should be given to Gregory Claiborne. <sighs> Something is weird here. Um, the box on the left with the large binders, the RV keys are in the basket by the kitchen sink, the POV keys are in the tray under the radio, in the car there is a storage space in Leesburg, VA, with a lot of artifacts and heirlooms that Sarah and Lydia will want to claim, redacted. The thumb drives in the small clothing bag behind the computer should go to J.M. Phelps in LA, redacted. The RV will probably have to go back to the bank m and in the Excel file. The car can be sold to pay off the remaining $4,000 still owed. Also see the Excel file. Francis, Francisca's ashes are in the bottom cabinet on the right of the refrigerator. The rightful heir to the house in Georgia is Sarah to Selman and Lydia Williams, Philip B. Hanley. Lots of interesting stuff. I'm going to leave it at that for right now, just because um, the, my battery is going to die. But we will definitely come back and do another another show on this here. Uh, it's definitely necessary. I have some questions, obviously. Lots of questions here. Um, so until then, uh, oh, let me post that before I forget. For anyone that wants it, uh, go back here. Let me answer that question. Just look for the Photoshop. There it is. There it is. Okay. Um, Thank you.
can download the document here. Should expire. What does it say? On the it should expire on the fifteenth. Having the info in the zip file to my website soon. Um, is truth nine one one dot wordpress dot com. All right, good peeps. Um, thank you all again. And um, oh, so much to go through. I feel like I'm just really starting. This is just my beginning on this case here. Just really taking a first glance, a first look. But we have some great people in the group, some great people on it. So again, it's in Facebook, the justice for um, Phil Haney, uh, DHS whistleblower. And I'm premiering a, a video right now, just with a bunch of his speeches and stuff. And then uh, I'll try to get those documents up to my website. And until then, God bless you all.